Hello and welcome to the Flower of Light Mystery School, connecting Egypt and Ireland. I'm Antoinette and today we're broadcasting from Trim along the beautiful Boyne. So this is the first of many podcasts that we'll have from the Flower of Light Mystery School and I'm joined today by Christine. Hello uh, Christine. Hi Antoinette. Um, I have a question for you. My first question is, what is a mystery school? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, Thank you. A mystery school is where any number of people come together to share the living wisdom that is known as alchemy. And so it's not dependent on a building or a particular place or a particular time. The wisdom of the mystery school stretches across dimensions, times, uh, places and people. So it's a living, infinite wisdom that's shared with people in any place, any time or any space. And that's really the most brief definition of a mystery school. And my mystery school in particular... Ah, oh, that was my next question. Uh, thank you. What about my, your mystery school? Uh, that's, that's right. <laughs> and my mystery school in particular is connecting Egypt and Ireland. As you know, I'm from Ireland and I went to establish my mystery school in Egypt in 2006. And it has been there ever since in front of the Valley of the Kings in Luxor. Absolutely. And so uh, since a child, of course, I knew the connection between Egypt and Ireland. But that's another long story and involving it's in a line how I went on this road. In a line, a line to Toth Hill. And it's a line to Toth Hill. Yeah. So my mystery school specifically focuses on connecting Egypt and Ireland and re re-establishing and remembering the language. Yes. That we that we discuss and that we learn and that we um, immerse ourselves in along the way. So um, let's get started. Um, you're having an upcoming journey uh, soon. That's and right. What. What do you think people might like to learn about some of the locations you're going to? Or do you have, is it very structured or is it fluid? Um, well, it's a mixture of both, really. It's structured in the sense that there's an itinerary that we follow. Yeah. Um, but it's fluid in the sense that, obviously, the itinerary can be changed if need be. But fluid in the sense that um, as we go in and out of the temples, each person's experience is going to be unique yeah. to them. So it won't be anything that you, you can, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all type of experience, you know? Yeah, and I know that um, I've been on uh, two journeys with you in Egypt, and it is it is really, it's the person's level of awakeness, and they and everybody has a unique experience, as well as a group experience. Well, that's the thing. I mean, when you go into the temples, the symbols on the wall are a language. But it's a language that our conscious mind doesn't understand. Right. It's a language that we've forgotten. It's the language that's talked about in the Tower of Babel story. Um, and when when each individual goes into a specific temple, um, those symbols on the wall broadcast information, to, but it's to the subconscious mind. Okay. And so each person will take an aspect of the information that they need. So, I mean, you could have 20 people in the same temple, right. looking at the same symbol or set of symbols. Yeah. And they'll all receive different information because that's, you know, how it works. It's it's a language that broadcasts to the subconscious mind because it is the language of the nature or the language of nature. Right. And, and it's the, 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 the language before the Tower of Babel. Yeah, and the subconscious the mind is always awake, never sleeps. Never sleeps. Yeah. And it never refuses information that's either. That's right. But the process then from, you know, going into the temple and from receiving, let's say, that information yeah. for each individual from the symbols that they require. Right. Um, it then needs to be processed and to like rise. Integrated. Like, integrated. Yeah. And then to rise, if you like, into the conscious mind so that the person then becomes consciously aware. Yes. Of the information they received mm -hmm. and how it connects. And as we move along from temple to temple and from site to site, um, it builds up. So, I mean, I always say that Egypt is like a book and each temple, and not necessarily temples, I mean, temples, mounds, stone circles, pyramids, they're all considered what we might call a temple or a sacred site. Mm -hmm. And so each sacred site is in itself almost like a chapter yeah. in the book. So... You know, every person's book is complete as they move through the sites that they need to 
they need to visit. Right. And, you know, I will intuit that as I'm, as I'm actually And that would be unique the to the group of people as it's well. It's unique to the group yeah. of people that I'll so be working it, with. So it really is synergistic. It's, it's like the people there interacting with you in the location and it, it's a unique formula for each group. Well, that's it. I mean, this... So it's not like a tour group. You're, you're marching through things. It's, no, it's no. You're doing it in the 3D, but its implications is across time and space because Absolutely. everything a, happens at once. Yeah, I mean, we are, we're doing it in 3D, as you say. Yeah. So, you know, we catch the bus at a particular time. Yes. We arrive at the temple. But once we're inside the temples, we step out of that 3D time and space. That's it. And that's where we access um, this language that I'm talking about. And this is the language of the Book of Coming Forth by Light. Yes. It's the language that's written all over the temple walls, all over every ancient and sacred site all over the world. The symbols that are on the walls, for example, spirals Mm -hmm. in Newgrange and all around Ireland in the sites around Ireland, we'll find spirals and concentric circles, uh, you know, the Triskelion. Yeah, um, the wavy lines. The wavy lines. Um, The rays coming from what appears to be a sun. Right. So all those kind of symbols, and in, in say for example in Egypt you have hieroglyphs, but they're they're, they're pictograms, right. but they're also symbols because they're all based on geometry. Right. So it is the geometry, it's the geometry that we're talking about here, um, and the language is made up of geometry, numbers, ratios, and sequences, numerical sequences, and it is a language, and it's the language of what was known in in ancient Egypt as the neater. But the word neater was mistranslated to represent the word God or gods. But the word neater actually more closely resembles nature. So what Egyptologists have translated as the gods, for example, mm-hmm. Isis, Osiris, Nephthys, Seth, Horus, Toth, Atom. In fact, if you change the word from gods to nature yeah. or aspects of nature, it will give you more closely um, the information that's involved, which is really yeah. alchemy. So the language of the neater or the language of nature is literally the blueprint of creation, the blueprint of everything that is in the physical manifest universe. It's interesting. What you were just saying reminds me of the Nikola Tesla quote, you know, yeah. the universe is 369. 369, yeah. And so that translates symbols, numbers, mm-hmm. sounds, vibrations, colors. Absolutely. So yeah. it is universal yeah. nature. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting you bring up those numbers as well because the whole code of the time-space matrix in which we experience what we call our reality right. is based on those numbers 3, 6, and particularly 9. It's right. a code of 9. So Right, because 10 is just 1 and 0 again. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so really what happens between 0 and 1 and mm-hmm. 1 and 0 is illusory really because everything is actually in the zero to begin with right and it's not zero is not nothing if you think of rather no thing rather than nothing yes and so when we say nothing what we mean is that it has it has the potential to be everything in other words still in its energy form yes with the infinite potential to be everything but not yet manifest manifest as anything so no thing in actual fact, is everything. Yeah, of course. Like the As void. As opposed to, to, to nothing. Yeah. So the zero represents that no thing, which in effect is infinite potential. Yeah. And the one represents that one infinite potential made manifest. Yes. And so from there, numerically speaking, we can trace out the pathway and the sequences and the steps of how energy collates and descends into physical matter and that is the language that we're talking about that is the language that's written all over these ancient sites and it's not just written on the walls of the sites in terms of the symbols and the pictograms it's actually written in the unit of construction the standard unit of construction so physically the building the building itself the building itself yeah and a lot of people wonder why stone masons for example (laughs) are Free part of, yeah, our Freemasons as are part of um, what we might call the Illuminati or the elite or the oligarch or the cabal. Yeah. Um, and people often ask, what have stone masons or masons got to do with that? Well, the act of creating a temple mm-hmm. or the very idea that you would have the blueprint 
to create a temple meant that you had the canon of proportions. Yeah. And building a temple followed the blueprint, the blueprint for creation, which meant that whoever had the knowledge to build a sacred site, a temple, meaning a pyramid, a stone circle, a mound, or what we might consider the more classic temple. Yeah. Whoever had that knowledge, the standard unit of measurement, the numerical sequences and ratios, the geometry, whoever had that knowledge yeah. was following the blueprint of how the manifest universe came into being. Right. So the building of a sacred site in its standard unit of measurement, in its placement on earth mm-hmm. and in its relation to other sacred sites recreates the act of the universe becoming manifest. As we've discussed before, people might not know that, but that's holographic in nature. So it's Completely holographic, yeah. So what you're saying is for the, for people to understand the physics of it, the holographic universe, right? Um, each temple is a replica of the universe, just like each Absolutely. person is yeah. a, is an organic yeah. replica of the universe. Very good point. So just to elaborate on that point, Luxor mm-hmm. Temple, for example, mm-hmm. uh, Luxor Temple is called the Temple of Man. Yeah. Um, but in particular, the Temple of Perfected Man. So if we were Oh, that's interesting. Perfected man. Perfected. It's not just the temple of man. And man, of course, meaning humanity, not man Man as in a male. We were talking about humanity. So the temple of the perfected being, I'll say, rather than man. Um, So, for example, if you were looking down on Luxor Temple, if you were in a hot air balloon or a helicopter, and you were looking down on... Helicopter. A helicopter, (laughs) yeah. If you were looking down over Luxor Temple... um, what you would see is that the temple itself is in the image of a human body. Right. So you see the head, the neck, um, the chest area, the abdomen, like the hips, even, the, the legs. The hyperstyle, just to interrupt you for a second, the hyperstyle hall is your ribs. Is the ribs, exactly. So just along the, na- the, the line of what you were saying about it being holographic. Mm-hmm. So Luxor Temple contains all, as, as all the temples do. Right. Luxor Temple contains all, as I mentioned earlier... Um, the whole of Egypt and the whole of the sacred sites in Egypt, when you take them all together, it's a book. And mm-hmm. each site is a chapter. But if we go along the lines of it being holographic, which it is, this information was left holographically so that in each site, it doesn't, it don't, it doesn't only contain its own certain aspect of the information, but it contains the entirety of the information. Yeah, but that's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. So, everything is there. Yes. Just like everything's site. in you. Absolutely. So everything is in each site, yes. in the entirety of the information. So yeah. I'll just give you an example as Luxor Temple. So if we consider the perfected being, mm-hmm. the perfected being is, is created according to the same blueprint that the entire universe, the entire manifest universe was created. Wow. It's the same blueprint on smaller and larger scales. Yeah. So Luxor Temple... And the symbols inside Luxor Temple and its standard unit of measurement, in other words, how it's actually built, right. represents that perfected being. And the conception of the perfected being in Luxor Temple takes place in the area that represents the third eye. Oh, okay. So the whole of Luxor Temple is giving you the entirety of the information, which is explaining to you how the 3D world and the world of energy, spirit Mm -hmm. or consciousness, whichever you like to understand it by, where those two realms meet. And those two realms meet in what we call the physical pineal gland. Right. So it's like the gateway. Pineal gland, the pituitary gland and the thymus together. Right. The thymus together are the third eye. Wow. So then so, your glands are so important. Your, absolutely. Yeah. The health of your body and the mm-hmm. glands functioning mm-hmm. properly is incredibly important for your consciousness. Absolutely. And Luxor Temple being in the image of the human body, mm. the human perfected being. Yes. Um, in actual fact, in areas shows channels along the ground that would be wow. reflecting the channels of how our blood flows through our system. That's amazing. Mm. Mm. And um, as you move into the temple and out. As you enter into Luxor Temple, you're actually entering in through the two feet. So if you can imagine, it's a human, it's a being lying on the ground, a human being lying on the ground. And as you enter in, you're actually walking in through the two feet. And you walk up into the area of the hips and the chest and the neck and into the head. But as you move up, 
You're also going up, right? You're, it's an elevation. It's elevated as, as you move in through the head. And you're also moving in through each chakra. Right. So as you move further and further into the temple, you're actually moving up each chakra from your base chakra to your sacral chakra to your solar plexus. Yes. And on up into the third eye and the crown. And as you move out of Luxor Temple, having gone through all that and into the area of the head and then out the other side, you are doing a physical representation of moving up through all the chakras and out through the crown, in other words, ascension. Right. And so in Luxor Temple... Conscious. Conscious ascension. In other words, with memory. Yeah, well, unconscious ascension is death. Yeah, exactly, yes. Conscious, there is no such thing as death. Yeah, I agree. It's unconscious ascension. So we ascend whether we know it or not, but the yeah. point is we, we don't remember. We that's don't. It. So and that's, it's considered death, and it's considered death for people who aren't aware of what continues. Of what they are, yeah. <laughs> Consciousness is eternal. Yeah. So, so Luxor Temple, just to explain the holographic nature, Luxor Temple uh, encodes the entirety of the information. So as we move on our journey from the south of Egypt, for example, mm-hmm. In the temples of Esna and Edfu, which would represent our um, base chakra, mm-hmm. moving from the base into the sacral, into the second chakra. So as we move on our journey over the 10 days, we move from the base chakra all the way up as we move to the solar plexus, which is in the location of Luxor. And then we move no on surprise. up into the heart. Luxor, golden exactly. light. Golden light, Luxor, <laughs> golden light. And as we move on up into see Abydos and Dendro, we mm-hmm. move into the heart chakra and then as we move on up to see Cairo, into Cairo and Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramid, we move into the area that represents the third eye and the crown chakra. And so you can see how the entirety of all the sites, and I've just briefly gone through them there, how all the sites in Egypt represent the chakras of the human body, the energy centers of the human body. Right. And so the path of the initiate, of the Mystery School initiate, on their journey um, to awaken those energy centers would be literally to move from the temples in the south of Egypt mm-hmm. all the way up to the north, to Cairo and to the pyramids at Giza. And that would be their final initiation in the greatest mystery school, which was the Giza. Yeah, and that Plato. is just, it's phenomenal what disinformation about that exists because it was so mystery, mysterious, right? People weren't allowed to know that. Mm. Like, cause to me, it just, it, it amazes me that people spend all the time and they go to Egypt and then they don't even know how the order of ascension progressed for the initiates in the mystery school, right? It was in order of, from the base chakras, mm-hmm. confronting things in the male energy and the female energy, depending right. on what size of the river you were on. That's right, right? yeah, that's a very good point. So each site that aligns so up not, along the Nile, yeah. yes, very good, very good point. Each site that aligns up along the Nile represents either the male or the female energy. Right. And so when we're working on the East Bank mm-hmm. and, and the area, for example, of the rising sun in the east. Exactly. That would represent the male energy. And all the sites that are along the West Bank of the Nile, which is the sun sets in the west, that would represent the feminine energy. Yeah. And the subconscious or the unconscious, if you like. And so it's the movement between those two, between the male energy and the female energy or the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And it's the movement and the upward movement, if you like, yeah. moving up along the Nile. If you can imagine as you cross over from one temple to the other, you're actually making a helix shape that would represent the double helix of the DNA. So that's amazing. Or two intertwined serpents. And if that's, you like. that's the Kundalini energy. That's the symbol of mm-hmm. the rod of Hermes. Yeah. So um, the caduceus. Right. The intertwined serpents. And at the top you have what looks like a ball and then two wings coming out. Right. So at the very top there is representing the Giza Plateau, if you like. The ball would represent... And the brain is the same time. And it would represent the brain because the Giza Plateau does represent the brain. Right. When I mentioned how Luxor Temple represents the perfected being... Right. And how it's embedded holographically. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole of Egypt, if you look at the whole of Egypt and the River Nile, and you think of the River Nile as the spine or the backbone. Or the Jed Pillar. Or the Jed Pillar, and the Jed Pillar was considered the backbone of Osiris. Right. So if you look at the the River Nile and consider it as a a backbone, as a spine, you can see how, as you move up the north towards the Giza Plateau, how and where the pyramids are placed, right at the base of the delta. Yeah. 
which would um, represent the brain, the area in the brain. And the Great Pyramid itself, between the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber, again, embedded holographically, represents the pineal gland and the pituitary. Yeah. And so, you know, why is that so important? Because the part, the initiate is creating a bridge between the conscious and the subconscious, or the unconscious, if you'd like to say. Right. And allowing itself to rise above the 3D time-space matrix that we call reality. our reality. Yeah. And it allows... Once the conscious mind is the most difficult part of the being to convince... Because the logical mind is the part of you that will always tell you that the most beautiful dream you've just had is, don't be so stupid, it's just a dream. Right. Exactly. And while you want to, while, while the feminine part of you wants to stay in that dream, because it feels very real. Yeah. And, and it is. It's another part of you in a different dimension. And right. it's as real as the part of you that's here. Of course. But it's your, it's your ego. And that you can also call your conscious mind your ego. Yeah. It's your ego that tells you, no, that was just a dream. That means nothing. Forget it. Exactly. Don't think about it. And so what we're looking to do is convince the conscious mind. We don't need to convince the subconscious. The subconscious already knows. And never forgets. Never forgets. The subconscious is the creator. And the subconscious holds all the memories, all the information of everything that ever has been, ever will be, and ever can be. So some people might call it the Akashic Records. It is the Akashic Records. Yeah. That's the Indian And what label. we're looking to do is create a bridge between... Our Akashic Records, the Akashic Records, the information and the entirety of all, and our ego in this 3D time-space matrix. And, that, and, and so going to Egypt is going to facilitate that for people? Absolutely, and going to all the sacred sites anywhere around the world. Yeah, but I was just going to ask you a question, which is, so I live in Ireland, you're from Ireland, we're, we love Ireland, and how, what is the connection between Egypt and Ireland? In, well, and the sites in Egypt and Ireland because they're completely different but they still exist absolutely well the sites in Egypt if you look at them are um, in, in, in geometry and in this language that I'm talking about the language of the universal language right the language of one the law of one right this is the language that we all understood it's a telepathic communication mm -hmm. and it is literally the language by which all matter and or sorry by which all energy becomes matter right so it is an intelligent energy and an intelligent design. And it's really made up of two, compo really two component parts, mm -hmm. which in and of themselves, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the one and the zero, or the zero and the one. So in geometry, we can call a zero a circle. Right. And we can call the one the straight line. Exactly. And again, it, it's telling us the same thing. So when we bring, in geometry, when we bring our circles and our straight lines together, we get something that is created that's more than the sum of its parts. Right. And in Egypt, if you look at all the structures, they're pyramids, they're temples, but they're all lines and angles. So in Egypt, everything we see is more representing male energy. Yeah. On the whole, that's not to say that, of course, the feminine energy was there as well but just on the whole when we look at the sites yeah so externally they are more angular it's a square building yeah, yeah they're more rectangular angular pyramid shaped tetrahedron shapes so they in geometry straight lines and angles represents male energy yeah and circles spirals um, concentric circles wavy lines all represent feminine energy so the question was the difference between the sites in Egypt and Ireland. So if we look at the sites in Ireland, we can see straight away just visually that all, they're all circles. Yes. They're circles yeah, exactly. and they're mounds. And then we go inside and what we have inscribed on the walls are spirals, are concentric circles, or even in are wavy ways, lines. The big dish is a circle. Yeah. Right. So on the face of it, now I'm not saying that the sites that are circular do not also represent male energy. That's not what I'm saying. No. All the sites represent both exactly. male and female energy. And both energy is activated within each site. Yeah, it's, it's a language. It's an absolute language. Yeah. But if we look at it visually, um, 
the sites in Ireland would represent the feminine energy. Yeah. And the sites in Egypt would represent the male energy. So, and if we look at the two symbols that would represent that, so this, the mound would represent the sites in Ireland. Yeah. The, sh- the pyramid shape or the triangle shape would represent the pyramid, the most well-known site in Egypt. Yes. And the five-pointed star, if you've been in Egypt, you see it everywhere. Yeah. Because it represents many things, but it also represents the star Sirius. But it also represents the human being within this cycle. Absolutely. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci's famous drawing. The yeah, Vitruvian man. man, exactly. Circling the square exactly. with the, uh, what would you call it? Um, it's a star, the star shape. I was trying to think of the Absolutely. sacred geometry. But so I, the symbol for the, the glyph for Sirius in Egypt... The glyph, the glyph for Sirius in Egypt is um, a triangle shape, mm-hmm. a mound, and a five-pointed star. And of course, so the pyramid is, you know, the most recognisable figure um, for Egypt, and the mound would be the most recognisable for Ireland. But in the sense of the lineage that would connect Egypt and Ireland, I'd just like to briefly talk about um, the lineage of Akhenaten. And of course, in Ireland here, we have the burial place of Queen Scota, whose real name was Merit Aten and who was potentially, maybe it's it's for open for discussion, but the brother of, sister rather, of um, Tutankhamun. So it's the lineage of Akhenaten and Scota and of course Teotihuacan yes. um, mm-hmm. that connects Egypt and Ireland. And they would be... Uh, the lineage in terms of the connection between Egypt and Ireland. But um, I intend, of course, to go into that in a lot more depth in other podcasts, as I do with many other subjects that are connecting these two most important places, Egypt and Ireland. So, Antoinette, you're having a journey to Egypt soon. So what date is that? So that's from, it's a 10-day journey uh, from the 20th to the 30th of November, where we'll be um, taking in many sites, of course, and ending the journey in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Oh, wow. And also, a question I have is, um, what's the significance of breaking the spell? So I've titled the journey, and the focus of that journey is, as you, as you mentioned, uh, breaking the spell. So really, the reason for that is more and more, and it's becoming more and more obvious, as we all know, um, how our consciousness is being controlled. And again, that's another thing for another conversation for another podcast but how we are being manipulated and um, our energy being harnessed and redirected and how this is happening actually to everybody really on the planet and while there are many people who are very much asleep and not aware of that it's affecting them anyway yeah whether they're aware or not but there are many people of course who are waking up and the way we break this spell is our own awareness. That is what breaks the spell. Once we remember this living wisdom, once we remember this knowledge, once we bring it to our conscious mind and our conscious mind and our ego agree with our subconscious mind, we have created and built the bridge. And once that happens, it's a quantum leap to an awakening and an ascension Mm. and a movement out of the third dimension. So... That's just briefly to um, give, you know, an indication really on um, what we will experience Mm. on our journey. Yeah. So just for now, anyway, I think we'll wind up this particular podcast. And as I said, there certainly will be many more to come after that. And I'd just like to say it's been really nice chatting with you today, Christine. And thanks very much. As always. (laughs) And um, thanks very much. And of course, I look forward to chatting with you again very soon. And take care, and goodbye, and love and light from the Flower of Light Mystery School. Absolutely. So long. Bye-bye.